evening. It's raining here in Southern California, but some of you are in Florida, some of you are in Pakistan. So I don't know what the weather's like over there. Anyway, uh, this is Wednesday, March 6th, 2024. It's my Wednesday night Bible study. We're in the book of Luke. We're in chapter uh, six, just starting chapter six. I've told you before that Luke is very um, specifically trying to make a case about starting backwards, why Paul is stirring up so much trouble in Rome. So he feels he has to tell the whole story. Let me tell the story because Paul is ups Rome is divided into three or four different sections. The Jewish believers who have been there, uh, the the new Jewish believers who now have believe in the Messiah that the Messiah has come, they're fighting. You've got the Roman citizens uh, who don't believe in anything, and then the new Roman citizens who suddenly believe in the Messiah. There's like four factions, and they're all fighting. In fact, Nero had kicked all the Jews out, whether they were believed in the Messiah or not, because of the, just the warring going on. And somehow, Paul is being blamed for the whole thing. You're up here stirring trouble. So Paul's on trial. He'd been on trial in Jerusalem uh, for a similar thing, stirring things up, and he had demanded to see, I demand to see uh, Caesar. So they shipped him off to Rome, and, and uh, Luke went with him. We'll read in the book of Acts exactly when Luke joined in with Paul and how he got involved with Paul. And now Luke is kind of writing a defense. He's trying to explain this whole thing. Uh, and that's kind of where the book of Luke and Acts come from. Um, so uh, Luke's done a lot of research and he's explaining how the Messiah, how Jesus is breaking Jewish tradition, but not breaking the law, breaking oral tradition. So the law is written down and then there was a second oral tradition, uh, which became the Talmud. When, once it was written down, where they kind of interpret the law. And when it says no working on the Sabbath, here's what it means. It means you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Now, it doesn't say that in the Bible. That was the rabbis helping to interpret what was good and what was wrong, what was bad. And then that kind of grew and eventually became bigger than the Bible. And so Luke is explaining, here's how Jesus was attacking this this train of thought. So in Luke chapter six, verse one, it says, now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields. What is he talking about the second Sabbath after the first, the first Sabbath ever or the first Sabbath? Okay. So uh, what most scholars think is that this is the first Sabbath is the first Sabbath that happens after the uh, Passover. Because um, the Passover is going to happen on the 14th of every Nisan, the 14th of March, basically for us. The 14th of Nisan is going to be Passover. Uh, and then the first Sabbath that happens after that. Um, and then this is, he says it happened on the second Sabbath. So there, there are seven Sabbaths that occur between Passover and Pentecost. Um, and so there, so on the second Sabbath after the first one, because that's kind of how they really, they had to count and make sure they were accurate. Uh, so that the day after the, so seven sevens is 49 on the 50th uh, day after the Pentecost. I mean, the 50th day of the Passover, that was when the Pentecost was. So they were keeping track. So it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that Jesus went through the grain fields and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them rubbing them in their hands. Now he's very, he's being very specific because eating is one thing, but once you rub the grain and, and, and the reason they're rubbing is because they're trying to separate the wheat from the chaff. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. So they're trying to get rid of the husk that was on the, the wheat so they could just eat it. They're just going to eat it raw. Um, they are not going through their grain fields. They are going through, thank you they are going through uh, someone else's grain fields. 
But this was lawful in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25. And again, Deuteronomy is summing up Leviticus and Numbers. In Leviticus and the book of Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, after the Exodus, Jesus, God said, okay, you guys are crazy. I'm going to have to write down some laws because you're crazy. And then the book of Numbers is kind of, let me show that I wasn't kidding when I wrote down all those laws. I have to start burning people up. And then Deuteronomy sums up everything that happened in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. So in Deuteronomy, he, he, they, he starts to sum up everything that God said. In Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25, it says, When you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. You can't just walk through and just mow everything down. This is all mine now. No, it's your neighbor's. But whatever you can carry in your hands, I, God was good with that. The reason why this was okay just to go through your neighbor's fields is because the concept was God saying, actually, all of it's mine. I'm the one that's growing it, and I'm allowing you to use it. I'm the one that's blessing you. So you're obligated to share with other people. If I blessed you and given you all this great, you didn't invent wheat. You didn't sit in the lab somewhere. You know what? I think I'll invent some wheat. You didn't. I created wheat. I created all the apples that are growing, the strawberries, the oranges. That's me. I created this. You don't really own them. You're just kind of renting that field. So if somebody is poor or if somebody's hungry, yes, you must let them eat. But not they can't just take a sickle and just chop all your stuff down. But whatever they can carry in their hands, yes, let them eat because that's not really yours. Um, so the disciples are going through grain fields and eating because they're hungry. Uh, they This was the on the Sabbath. And they had been fasting because you, you had they, they had to fast, and now they probably have broken their fast, break fast, right? And so now they're hungry because they're with Jesus. And is Jesus stopping to eat very often? No, I don't know why. This this man is never hungry, so they're just like. But Jesus leads them through the grain fields, like you guys eat because I'm you're bugging me. So they're eating. Where they messed up, as far as the Pharisees are concerned, is they're also rubbing the grain to get rid of the husk. Well, now they're doing work. And you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Okay. So in Luke chapter 6, verse 2, it said, now some of the Pharisees, now it's probably the same Pharisees that Matthew mentions in chapter, Matthew chapter 15, verse 1, it says, then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus. So they're up north. So eventually all these, initially all these scribes were down in Jerusalem, but they're hearing about stuff that Jesus is doing up north. They're very fascinated. Oh, have you heard about this man doing miracles? And like, what? So they can't have that. They're really there at first just to hear if he's going to confirm everything they're saying. You may preach as much as you want, as long as everything you say is in agreement with what we've already said. But when they hear Jesus saying, now you've heard that it was said this, but I'm telling you this. They're going, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. We got to stop this guy. So they came up from Jerusalem really just to find him doing something wrong so they can say, this man's a lawbreaker, because that was their job. They were the spiritual police. You know some of those people. Some of them may go to your church. It's their job to tell you what you're doing wrong. You did that wrong. You did that wrong. So that they're going to catch Jesus, declare him a lawbreaker. Then they don't have to worry about him anymore. You can't believe that man. He broke the law. And, you know, and they knew every single law. Okay. So, uh, so in Matthew chapter 15, verse 1, 2, then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now they did. The disciples washed their hands whenever they ate bread, but they didn't do it in the elaborate way that had been passed down. Uh, because in order to prove you were more spiritual than the next group, you had to add in even more tradition. And, you, you know, I wear a turban while you did it. Or what they just came up with more stuff just to prove that they were more spiritual than the next person. So they're so they're there to accuse Jesus. So they see the disciples rubbing their hands together and rubbing the grain in order to get rid of the husk. So he, they said to him, "Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath?" So, uh, and there, so. You can go through any time you want and pick grain. Again, it was the thing about don't do it on the Sabbath. 
In Exodus chapter 16, again, don't do any work on the Sabbath. You can eat on the Sabbath, but just use your lips. As soon as you use your hands, you're working. Okay. Exodus chapter 16, verse 26 says, Six days you shall gather it. But on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, there will be no work. Why is God telling them this? Because he needed a day where they relaxed. They're so worried. And God's saying, I'm going to give you quail. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you manna. You can run all over the place and run here and run there. Oh, I think there's some manna over there. Because they never knew where the manna was going to be. It was just going to fall. And they were running and they had to make sure they gathered more than their neighbor. And again, God said, don't do that because if you gather too much, I'm going to make it spoil. If you don't gather enough because somebody took yours, I'll multiply yours. You don't have to try to make sure you gather more than somebody else. You don't, it's not going to work. I'm going to have enough for everybody. God doesn't like the greedy. They exist today. I've got to have more than anybody else. And they, you know, remember, I'm just, remember during COVID and people would go to the grocery store and get 59 bottles of this and 107, it's like, and not save any for anybody else. And God's like, that's not right. Just take enough for what you need for this week and then come back next week. You don't have to take enough for the next 15 months. Um, Anyway, and so that's how God felt about the grain. Like, why are you doing that? But that's just paranoid. If I don't, there won't be enough. So they're running all over the place. He says, you can get it for six days, but I'm going to give you enough on the sixth day for the Sabbath. Just trust me and relax. It's going to be an exercise in relaxing. It, the, the Sabbath day is an exercise in believing that God will come through with you. And you don't have to work all night and worry all night. He wants us to spend a day where we're just trusting God. Okay? So... On the, on, the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day, don't, there will be none of this running around. Verse 27 of Exodus chapter 16. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the Sabbath day anyway together, but they found no food. Surprise, because they thought God was making that up. And the Lord, verse 28, the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Now, not Moses, but he's talking to, you know, talking to the people through Moses. See, verse 29, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath, Therefore, he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Just relax. So the people rested on the seventh day. So he's trying to keep people from worrying and stressing out and thinking, oh, I don't have enough. Because he was supplying double on the sixth day. Once they got into the promised land, he stopped doing that. He didn't give them manna. He, he just blessed their fields and stuff like that. So it's not like on the seventh day, you can't gather any We That was very specific is what I'm trying to teach on Sundays for the, for the six of you that are listening, bless your hearts, on Wednesdays and on Sundays in the book of Leviticus. <laughs> well, said, Ooh. So uh, that the law was very specific, addressing very specific uh, circumstances that didn't apply later on. And, and so it's not like you can't eat on the seventh day. On the sixth day, manna was coming down, and he was giving them enough manna on the sixth day to last for, for two days. Once they had their own fields, the food was there seven days a week. So you can go out on the seventh day and eat. He was trying to train them not to worry, like take a day off from worry and just rest. But he wasn't saying you can't eat on the seventh day. He says you, do, you don't need to run around on the seventh day. I've given you enough on the sixth day. So on the seventh day, just relax. Don't, don't do anything. Just relax. You don't have to run around. Relax. But they're interpreting that as don't do anything on the Sabbath. You can't. You got to stay still. Don't you dare move on the Sabbath because that's the day of rest. And you better not do anything. So on purpose, Jesus, when he came, he kept doing stuff on the Sabbath day. On purpose. The majority of Jesus' miracles were on the Sabbath just to make them crazy because they had added to the law. They had misinterpreted the law and then added to it. We have done the same thing today. In John chapter 5, verse 8, it's, Jesus said to the man who was um, by the pool of Bethesda, and, he, and, and Jesus had said to him, would you be made whole? And he complained, I would like to be made whole, but let me tell you why it won't happen. So Jesus said to the man, rise, take up your bed and walk. Verse 9, and immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. John points it out because he wants to point out Jesus on purpose did it on the Sabbath. Jesus approached the man. The man didn't come up to Jesus. 
the man didn't know who Jesus was. Jesus waited until the Sabbath to approach this man. Could have gone up to him any time, but he waited until, because the man's there every day. He waited until the Sabbath to do it on the Sabbath just to make the people crazy who had made up stuff about the Sabbath that wasn't true. John, verse, John 9, verse 13. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was the Sabbath, verse 14, when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Jesus approached that man on the Sabbath. He was blind. The man was born blind. Jesus had seen this man many times, but he waited until the Sabbath to heal him. On purpose, Luke chapter 13, verse 15. I mean, Luke, Luke, Luke 13, verse 14. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days in which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them, but don't, not on the Sabbath. Don't, you can't be healed on the Sabbath. Why not? The Bible doesn't say you can't be healed on the Sabbath. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of things that the Bible doesn't say that we have added to it and just assume it's there. It's not there. And that's not even why it was written. God didn't write, I don't want you to do anything on the Sabbath. Uh, the Sabbath is the holy day. Don't do anything. He was telling them specifically, you don't have to run around on the Sabbath. I'm going to give you two days worth on the sixth day. So I'm trying to teach you to trust me, believe me, because you don't believe that I'm going to come through. Trust that I've given you enough on the sixth day that you don't have to do anything on the seventh day. But he didn't mean for all time, you must just stand still on the Sabbath and you can't do nothing. That's not what he was trying to say. That's why Jesus keeps doing stuff on the Sabbath, because they made that part up. Luke 14, verse 2. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus, so Jesus is teaching in a particular synagogue. There's a man just standing there who has dropsy, who's listening to Jesus teach. He did not come up to Jesus and say, it's the Sabbath, will you heal me? He hadn't said nothing to Jesus. He's just listening to Jesus teach. But Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now they've already said, no, he'd already not. And so he, so he turns and he heals the guy on the Sabbath because they thought you can't do any healing is work. And the Bible says, do no work on the Sabbath. No, that's not. And so Jesus is going to teach them. Here's what God was going after. So Luke chapter six, verse three. So they, they, they approach Jesus. Why are disciples doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath? On the Sabbath, you can't do work. That's not what it means. But Jesus answering them said, have you not? even read this what david did when he was hungry he and those who were with him because again if they're hungry god's not trying to make people starve on the sabbath that's not what the sabbath was created for oh, sorry you can't eat it's the sabbath though but i have to make a sandwich. you can't you can't make a sandwich on the sabbath because that causes worth you can't use a knife you can't and be, and they were going to that extreme you if if, if you were living in Israel today, you can't turn on a life, you can't use an, an elevator, because you can't do any work on the Sabbath. It's like, but I need to get up to my room. Sorry. But I need to, it's dark and I can't see. Sorry, you can't turn on the light, because that, that's, that light uses electricity. And that, so you have to sit in the dark. Jesus invented the day where you have to be hungry and in the dark and crazy, because it's the Sabbath, and I want you to be crazy on the Sabbath and alone in the dark and hungry. That. What kind of God is that? But that's how they think God is. That God just arbitrarily makes up crazy rules. That's why half the world doesn't believe in God because they think he's a crazy God. He makes up crazy rules. No man made up those rules because they're misinterpreting the Bible. So he said, remember when David was hungry? Remember when David was hungry? And those who were with him and, and he went to the temple? So let's, let's just quickly read that section. In 1 Samuel 21, again, David was running from Saul. David, Saul had said, I'm going to kill you, David. And so David took his men and left. This is after Saul had thrown a spear at him three times. Saul had threatened his life. Saul had done. David kept thinking, oh, he's just kidding. And then he realized, oh, no, no, this man's actually going to kill me. So David took his men and he snuck out. He said bye to Jonathan. They hugged and kissed and crept and cried. And then he left. 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 1. Now David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, uh, why are you alone and no one was with you? Because David had told his men, you wait out there. You know, I'm going to go in by myself. And so again, if if the president of the United States or the president of the Senate or a king suddenly just knocked on you, hi, can I come in? It's like, uh, no. Why are you all by yourself? Why is the Secret Service with you? Why are you just showing up? Here? Like it's suspicious. Like you're like one of the most important men in the country. 
why are you by yourself? Why is there not an army of people with you? So he was afraid. Verse 2 of 1 Samuel 21. So David said to Ahimelech the priest, uh, the king, and he lied, the king has ordered me on some business, and he said to me, uh, do not let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you, or what I've commanded you, and I've directed my young men to such and such a place, and now therefore, what have you on hand? Can you give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or whatever can be found? Like, can you feed me, please? And he's lying, but he's hungry. But he doesn't want to say, well, Saul's about to kill me because he doesn't know. Is this one of Saul's priests who's going to say, Saul, he's here. Is, is he the Nazi from The Sound of Music? You know, it, like, I don't know if this man's going to rat me out. So I'll just make up a story. Uh, and the, so in verse 6 of First Samuel 21, it says, The priest gave him holy bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread. So what is the showbread? The showbread... Um, they, they, there was bread that was supposed to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And it was supposed to, it sat there all week long. They would cook it and they made, they made 12 loaves that would sit on the show table. And the show bread would sit there. And the show bread means bread that represents the presence of God. And it was as though God was fellowshipping with the 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 loaves of bread and they would put incense by each loaf and it would be and they would set the incense on fire and it would burn as though the prayers were being offered up. They would watch the smoke and it was like the prayers were being offered up to God and the it, bread would sit there. But on the Sabbath, they could eat the bread, but they would make, they would bake new bread. And then as soon as they would lift up the old bread and put down the new bread right at the same time, like there would be priests on one side and priests on the other side and two would lift up the old bread and two would put down the new bread. Cause it said that it had to be there continually. There must be bread continually. So once they replaced it, then you could eat that bread. You could eat the old bread that had been there sitting there for a week, and the, but only the priests could eat it because uh, only the priests were allowed to come into the holy place. The regular people, all their stuff would happen outside at the big, huge barbecue pit that was outside, but they couldn't come in the temple. Uh, so verse 3, uh, verse 6, so the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the show bread, which had been taken from before the Lord, in order to put hot bread at its place on the day when it was taken away. So they had just, David just happened to walk in when the, when the show bread had been eaten. Now he'd done this on the Sabbath and he was hungry and the priest let him eat the bread. So he said, remember how the priest, when David was hungry? Because my disciples are hungry and you're saying they can't eat on the Sabbath. But remember when David was hungry on the Sabbath? Verse four, Luke six, verse four, and how he went into the house of God and took and ate the show bread and also gave some to those who were with him. Because he took like five loaves. And the guy knew there's somebody with you because you, you can't eat five loaves of this bread. So you must have some men with you. He says, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. Because in the law, it says that only the priest can eat this bread. In, in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 5, it says, And you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. And two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake, but no leaven. And you shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. In verse 7 of Leviticus chapter 24. And you shall put frankincense on each row that it may be on the bread for a memorial. That word on the bread really means next to the bread. They did not pour frankincense on the bread and then try to eat it. It was next to the bread. For a memorial, an offering made by fire to the Lord. So they would set the incense on fire and they would go up to right. The, it would smoke and it would smell good in there. And every Sabbath, verse 8, he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. I mean, it has to be there constantly. There must always be bread there. That's why they would, as soon as they take up one bread, they put the other one down. It should be taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. Now, when it says taken from the children of Israel, meaning the bread is paid for by their offerings, by the money, the shekels that they would bring, that would pay for the flour. And, and so, it really, so this was their bread that they were offering to the Lord. Verse 9 says in, in Luke, uh, I mean Leviticus 24, and it shall be for Aaron and his sons. Nobody else. It's for the Aaron, who's a priest, and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. I mean, this has to be this way forever. This is perpetual. You can't do any different. So he's saying, remember how David ate that, even though it was on quote unquote unlawful for him to do it? Why was it okay for him to do it? We'll talk about why it was okay for him to do it in just a minute. Matthew chapter 2. 
12 verse 5. Well, let me let me it it was okay for him to do it because um if you're hungry, the Sabbath was made for people who were hungry. Um the law here's the here's the law that God expected us to keep. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. He spelled that out in the Ten Commandments, where the first four or five are all about how to worship God. Don't have any God before me. Don't make any idols. And then the second five commandments, or six, are all about how to treat your neighbor. You don't covet your neighbor. You don't commit adultery. You don't steal from your neighbor. And Jesus said that's just summed up in love the Lord your God and then love your neighbor. So if your neighbor is hungry, you feed him. You're, you're keeping the law by helping people on the Sabbath or by worshiping God on the Sabbath or by loving God and being obedient to him on the Sabbath. You're keeping the law. That's all that the law is. The rest of the stuff in Leviticus is very specific to very specific situations, but it doesn't supersede the commandments, which is love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. So if your neighbor walks in hungry, you can't say, oh, no, 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 no. In Leviticus chapter 18, it says you can't do this. So I know you're hungry and you're starving to death, but I can't feed you on the Sabbath. It's like, that's crazy. The law, all that God, if we just love God with all our hearts and love our neighbor, you fulfilled the law. All the rest of it is just very specific things concerning very specific circumstances that really were a reaction to you know how crazy Egyptians are and you crazy how the how crazy the Babylonians are and all of them. I've got to write down very specific things that they're doing that I don't want you to do because it's going to detract you from worshiping the Lord God with all your heart. Because if you do the crazy stuff they do in, in their worship, then you won't be worshiping me. If you treat their neighbors by raping them and killing them and doing all these horrible things, then you won't be loving your neighbor. So let me so let me write down the very specific things that they do that I don't want you to do. And, and let me write down these very specific ways that I want you to worship me so that I can, because I'm training you how to worship. You have bad habits. So I'm, I'm training you, but I'm training you to do these things so that you can fulfill the royal law, which is love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So anything that you do out of love, in fact, I called tonight's lesson a work, works of love, works of love. Anything that you're doing out of love, genuine love, not something that you made up. I love pizza, so I killed that man. That's not really love. But but genuine love for God and genuine love for your neighbor, all of that is legal. All of that is lawful. So you can't use one law to stop the other. Well, it says here on the you can't do any work on the Sabbath. And can you remember how Jesus was about to heal somebody? And Jesus, and they said, Oh, how dare you heal that person? He says, So if you're if your ox fell in a in a ditch on the Sabbath day, you wouldn't just leave them there for two days and let, you'd pull them out. That's showing love. You try to say, I, I can't heal on the Sabbath. Do you not understand what the law is about? That the law is love? That so Jesus came to burst all that stuff. Uh anyway, so in Matthew chapter 12, because Luke only gets half of what Jesus said, Matthew gives the other half of what Jesus said in that very same situation. So in Matthew chapter 12, verse 5, he says, Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath, and yet they're blameless? What do you mean they profane the Sabbath? Well, Numbers chapter 28, verse 9 says, And on the Sabbath day, two lambs in the first year without blemish and two tenths of an ephah of fine flour as a grain offering mixed with oil with its drink offering. So he says, you got to sacrifice two lambs on the Sabbath and you and and then two tenths of an ephah of fine flour as you have to give a grain offering on the Sabbath mixed with oil and you got to give a drink offering on the Sabbath. Now he's saying there if you're supposed to not do any work on the Sabbath, how come that they are doing work? They're slaughtering lambs and offering them up. That's work. So if, if you think you can do nothing but stand still on the Sabbath, how come the priests, they profane the Sabbath every Sabbath? They do work on the Sabbath. This, at verse 10 of Numbers 28, this is the birth offering for every Sabbath. Besides the regular birth offering with this drink offering they're doing during the week, but every Sabbath, I make them do work. They, they're doing work. So if they're not supposed to do work, as how you interpret not doing work, 
how come they're killing and 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 sacrificing lambs and doing all this work? She says, have you not read in law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath? And and yet they're blameless. Why? Because the, because you've got it all wrong. It's not you may do nothing on the Sabbath. You have you have to worship God. If, if if part of your worship to God is is uh, do, uh, sacrificing these lambs, then you can do that. If part of if, if loving your neighbor and feeding them on the Sabbath and healing them and that you're fulfilling the law. One law doesn't cancel the other. Again, I only told you when they were in the wilderness and I was feeding them with manna on the sixth day that I was going to give them enough for the sixth and the seventh. I said, don't run around on the seventh day. Just relax. You have enough to eat. That didn't mean for all time you could do nothing. That was specific to the wilderness. And there are laws in Leviticus that we are trying to make them good for today. And they were specific to then. But what will always be for today is always worshiping Lord your God and always loving your neighbor. That doesn't change. Those are perpetual laws. So if you're doing evil on the Sabbath, you're bad. You know, if, if that's God's mad at you. But if you're loving your neighbor, if you're and you're worshiping God in whatever way that God directs you to do, if you're being obedient, obedient to God, if God directs you to go and on the on the on a Sunday hand out food to the ill and the then you can't do that. That's work. Yes, I can. God directed me to do it. If God tells you to go shopping and, and hey, buy something for your neighbor across the street. You can't shop on a Sunday. That's work. No, God told me to do it. So, so whatever God's telling you to do, he just asks for your obedience. He wants one day a week where you're just totally obedient to him. Fine. We enter into a Sabbath rest. God no longer says, he doesn't no longer limit it to one day. Every day he would love for you to be obedient to him. Every day. This is not a day where you've got to do all of this, you know. But anyway, so Jesus is challenging them, saying, you don't understand the law. Matthew chapter 12, verse 6, he says, Yet I say to you that in, their, in, their, in this place, there is one that's greater than the temple. So he just says, you've not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath, and yet they're blameless, right? So the temple is full of God's presence. Then Jesus points to himself and says, yet I say to you that right now here, there is one that's greater than the temple. Because I am God's temple right now. God is residing in me. And so whatever God tells me to do is lawful. So the body of the son of man was the truest, highest temple of God. He built a temple made of stone. First, it was a tent, but it made of stone for his presence. But ultimately, our body, especially the body of Christ. Now, you know, we're imperfect, but Jesus was perfect. So he built a temple as a type of the Messiah to come and how his presence filled the temple. So he's saying, if, if whatever they did in the temple was correct, sure, I'm, I'm greater than the temple. So whatever God tells me to do because I'm his temple, it's correct. You're challenging me and you're wrong. So I, have, I can do at least as much as the priests would do. If, if, if the priests were allowed to worship God and offer offerings, I can do the same thing. Matthew 12, verse 7. But if you had known this, what this means, when, when in, in Hosea it said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. So again, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6 says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. So if you had understood that what I wanted for you was mercy, it means love, compassion, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. I preferred that to all the sacrifices for your sins. I don't want you to spend all day sacrificing for your sin. I want you to spend all your day doing good. I desired mercy. I wanted you to love one another and love God. That's what I wanted from you. When I first showed up in the mountain, I said, love your Lord your God with your heart. Love your neighbor. That's what I wanted. But I had to teach you all these other things because you're so, you were so crazy at the time. But I didn't want them to supersede loving God and loving your neighbor. We have let the law supersede those things. People are too busy pointing out, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, and you did this. and you. Did that. In fact, he said, if you understood what it meant, 
I desire mercy and not sacrifice, then you would not have condemned the guiltless. There are people who were guiltless, and yet you made them feel horrible like they were going to hell because they were doing certain things on the Sabbath, and you were wrong. Because what I wanted from you was mercy. I wanted you to love. I, I, you, you don't need the law. You just need to learn to love God with all your heart and learn to love your neighbor. He says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. If you had spent your time knowing me, then you'd spend your time doing good. But you, but you, instead of every day just burning an offering because you messed up, just burning you burning an offering and then going around being evil to somebody is going to send you to hell. You thinking, oh look, I, you know, I showed up at church on Easter, so the rest of the year I can be as evil. No, God's like, I don't want the burnt offering. I want knowledge of God. I want you to know me all year long. But these little trinkets you do, oh, well, I gave, uh, you know, $20 to that. So therefore, I must be a good person. It's like, no, that doesn't make you a good person. I don't do, I want knowledge of God, not burnt offerings. I don't want your offerings. I want you, your heart, you. So he's trying to, like, Jesus is trying to correct. You don't get what the law was about. And now you've made yourself arbiters of the law, walking around telling everybody, give a tenth of your cinnamon. Give a tenth of your nut, your nutmeg. Give a tenth, and it's like no, that doesn't fulfill the law. The law is loving God and loving people. That's what the law is. If you're doing that, you're doing good. Uh, in Mark chapter two, verse twenty-seven, Mark gave a, another part of this conversation that he had. Luke didn't write it all down, but Matthew wrote down some of it. Mark wrote down some of it. So he says to them, "The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. God didn't." create the Sabbath, oh, I need a day when nobody does nothing, and now I'll create man so that he can do nothing on the Sabbath. He says, no, the Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath, was, I created a day so that man could learn to relax, learn to know me, learn to hear my voice. He's working all week long, and he's striving, and he's all he does is he's worried about, uh, I've got to pay this bill and pay that bill. I gotta do so I gave him a day where he could relax and hear my voice and be loving and worship and, and love his neighbor. The Sabbath was made for man. I gave him a day, not the other way around. I didn't make a day that you can punish man and make him go hungry. If he's hungry on the Sabbath, feed him. I didn't create a day where man is supposed to do nothing. I created a day where man can replenish himself and hear from God. And uh, so therefore he says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I decide what's right and wrong on the Sabbath. God tells us what's right and wrong. You go to God and say, hey, Lord, what you want me to do today? Now, that's what we're supposed to do every day. But at this point, Jesus had not yet fulfilled the law, so they were still under the law. Now we're under the law that God writes in our hearts, right? So uh, at this point, Jesus is still saying, here's how the law works on that seventh day, I'm Lord of the Sabbath, you listen to me, you obey me. And so if I tell the disciples, go out and feed yourself because they're hungry, then we're good. They're good. There we go. So um, Luke chapter six, verse five. So he says to them, the son of man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now, Luke chapter six, verse six, it happened on another Sabbath also that he entered the synagogue and taught. I just moved my camera. So thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I could feel what you were thinking. So now it happened on another Sabbath also that he entered the synagogue and taught. So this is the next Sabbath. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath. Again, Jesus is purposely doing it on the Sabbath because they had made up the wrong rules about the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him because if they can say, see, he broke the law, then they can dismiss him. They no longer have to listen to him. So they're waiting for him to do something wrong. But he knew their thoughts, verse 8, and he said to the man who had the withered hand, arise and stand here. Now, again, the man didn't come there to be healed. Jesus purposely, I'm going to heal this man on the Sabbath to make them crazy because they have it all wrong. God will do stuff to make us crazy. 
we think it has to happen only this way. Only this, you know, my preacher said that this was going to happen this way, and God will make sure it doesn't happen that way so that we can question it and go, wait a minute. I thought it, I was told it could only happen this way, and yet it happened that way. Because he wants us to re-examine. Maybe I'm looking at that wrong. So Jesus purposely healing on the Sabbath. So they go, wait a minute. I thought on the Sabbath you weren't supposed to do anything. No, no. I wrote the entire law so that you would love me with all your heart and love your neighbor. These other things were just ways of fulfilling those things. But what I want you to do is love God and love your neighbor. That's what I want you to do. I want you to do that on a Sabbath. And so if that means healing somebody, do that on the Sabbath. If that means feeding them, do that on the Sabbath. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had the withered hand, arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. Okay, I don't know why this man told me to stand. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy? I mean, what do you think on the Sabbath? Good or evil? Saving people, destroying, what, what, what do you think is lawful? Let's redefine what the Sabbath is. is because is the book of Leviticus is a, a bunch of, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. No. Do the loving thing. So works of love done for the body of man or the soul of man, you're feeding them spiritually you're feeding their physical body you're healing them you're helping somebody they never mar or in any way interfere with the holiness of a day of rest you healed that man that's against the law i mean that's how crazy they were and but the, i i promise you there's a bunch of stuff today that we think that have been misinterpreted and and it's crazy if it's like well that doesn't make any sense why would god do that he didn't that doesn't you're right that doesn't make any sense that God would, but there are things that we think, but God said, no, no, he didn't. Man has just interpreted that way. Okay. Verse 10, and then I have to be done. Verse 10 and 11, and then I'm done. And when he looked around at them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Now the man had the withered hand. I can't, I can't stretch it out. That's the whole point, Jesus. Hello. Stretch out your hand. So he did so, and his hand was restored, as whole as the other. Verse 11, but they rejoiced. No, it says in verse 11, but they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. So it made them angry because they don't know who God is. If you're not helping, if we're not aiding if we are depriving people, if we are hurting people, that's not God. We think we're doing the right thing. We think we are. You shouldn't be healing on the Sabbath. You think that. But you totally have, we have totally missed God, who he is and what he's about. And so God's going to force us to re-examine. He's going to let things happen that are going to shock us. How'd that happen? Why is it? So that we are going to be forced to re-examine. Why did God let that happen? Because God's trying to change our minds and, and reorient us to what is most important. I desire mercy. I desire knowledge of God. You don't think it's right to do good? What is a good thing to do? But that's going to mess this up. That's going to change. That's going to be... No, it's not. I, if you do good, if you bless others, if you help them, I'll restore you. I will help you. I will. You think, but I'm going to lose out. I've got to grab it all for myself. i got to have it all. No, you don't. If you share, I will bless you. If you try to snatch it all for yourself, the Bible says, God says, you're putting it into pockets with holes in them. You're just going to, you're going to, you're going to look up later and, and not have what you thought you had because you were so fearful to share. You were afraid to give. You were afraid, you're afraid, we're gonna lose everything if we give. Uh, no, you won't. God says, I will bless you. I will bless you. I will bless you. <sighs> so you have to just relax and trust God. Should I be doing good or evil? Should I be doing, should I, is it, 
so that's what we have to examine ourselves. All right, uh, I'm done. Thank you so much for listening to my diatribe about doing good. Um, on Sundays, we're in the book of Leviticus, and I'm finally going to get to the part that's going to make everybody truly crazy because you say, oh, I've been listening the past couple of weeks. I haven't been that crazy. Okay, this Sunday. Um, and then also on Sunday, I'm teaching at my church on the book of a second Samuel. So thank you again for listening. The four of you were so nice enough to, to listen to all my rantings. And I'll see the rest of you next week. All right, bye-bye.